Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com and RockAuto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb. Welcome, everyone, to MotorWeek podcast number 255. I'm John Davis, of course. And joining me today, our senior executive producer, Dave Scrivener. Hi there. Our over the edge reporter and podcast producer, Greg Carlos. Hello from the MotorWeek offices. He indeed. And our very special guest, our online auto parts expert, Tom Taylor. Tom, welcome. John, thanks for having me. Great to have you back with us. Well, we've got a lot of topics today. We're actually going to spend quite a bit of time uh, on things that are really that right up uh, Tom's alley. But we also do have um, our review of the uh, 2022 Honda Civic, a new generation of Civic. And Greg will be leading us off on that. But let's start. I know this is something that basically anyone that is buying a car for a, a long time uh, is concerned with. And I know almost every car I've ever bought, I bought it, one of these. And I'm talking about automotive service manuals. You know, those big, thick books that basically told you everything about at least the same information that most of the uh, automotive technicians had uh, in getting into the nitty gritty into your car. Tom, are they gone? I mean, I, I understand that basically the companies that used to print these aren't even printing them anymore. What are people supposed to do? The big names were, was always Shelton and Haynes. And about 20 years ago, those two companies combined. So if, if you have a, a car built in the last 20 years or so, if you get the, you buy a Chilton manual and a Haynes manual, the content's identical. So you just really need to buy one or the other. Um, and, and then last year, in 2020, another company, it's, um, Digital Info Pro, I think it's called, bought the, uh, the Haynes Chilton company. And soon after they announced they're not gonna make any more manuals for, for new cars. Mm. They're going to come up with some new sort of system. Uh, I'm guessing it'll be online. They're, the company's is Digital Info Pro, I think is the name of it. Their company's background is is uh, databases for professional mechanics in Europe. So I'm guessing it'll be an online system. Kind of like all data is here for mechanics. Exactly. You have a subscription service. You can you can log in and get the repair orders and the time sequence things like that from all data. And yeah, service so bulletins too. Yeah. They promise that they'll keep uh, printing and, and making the, uh, the uh, disc copies of the, the manuals for older cars indefinitely. So th that's good news. And, th and they, they've made, uh, Haynes and Chilton made print manuals up for, for uh, up through 2018 for some cars. Mm. So the, the, yeah, yeah the, today's newer cars that are moving into the time of the need service, there'll still be manuals available. And, and then the, the factory service manuals are still around. And there's companies that are get licensing those and there, there's actually more factory service manuals becoming available for older cars every mm. year. Mm. Um, Detroit Iron, Graham, or a couple of companies that, that reproduce the service manuals. And, and for some old classics, they even reproduce like sales brochures from the car dealers, which are kind of fun and, and owner's manuals. and. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, overall it's good news. I, I understand why it, it, it's becoming harder to do the print manuals. It's, it's hard to figure out what to even include in there. They, they were grouped by model. And if the, the model, there might be an all wheel drive version, a hybrid version, an all electric version. Which car do you disassemble to, to uh, come up with the manual? Yeah. And, and people basically just want to look up YouTube videos now anyway. I can't tell you how many times I'm around a car and it's just like, well, I could go to the library or look it up online, but <laughs> YouTube's right here, and I'll just have somebody walk me through it. I've done that. No problems. <laughs> the problem, the, well, the, well the, the problem that comes there is that you don't know who it is. You don't know how accurate the information right. is. Sometimes they're just really bad at making videos, and it's like, okay, the information's there. Maybe the knowledge is in your head, but there's, there's actually like a market for somebody who has the production capability and the knowledge. So, I mean, they're... I feel like that could be the future of, you know, service manuals. Hmm. Go ahead, Tom. I, well, yeah, I was just thinking about the YouTube thing. I, I, uh, I mean, there's guys there and gals that are really conscientious about trying to do a good job. And, and I, I just replaced the oil pump recently on, on my 79 Chrysler 360. And I found a YouTube video where 
somebody had done that on a on a truck and and they were super conscientious about having torque specs and everything but but they messed up the uh which gasket overlaps which in, in the back. and it, it's like I, I was lucky i i had the uh the, the service manual would say, no, nah, this is the right way to do it. So, <laughs> and then new, more flexible gaskets, that vehicle probably be fine too. But it, yeah, just little details, it's good to have a couple different sources. My, my problem with all that is that that means you've got to have a tablet or something right there with you. Oh, right. Uh, you know, and you're, let's say you're flat on your back, you've got your hands full of grease. You're, you're to the point where you need to go back and refer to the video. It was one thing to get a grimy old, you know, shop manual kind of, uh, you know, messed up a little bit with greasy fingerprints. Is it a real substitution? You need your VR goggles, John, so you can yeah. swipe in the air. And well, the yeah, I guess that's true. I guess I'm just old fashioned. Well, I just still well, like to have the pages. But go ahead. So, so uh, you know, Children like myself, like myself, was um, <laughs> re replaced as this flashlight holder. Now they had magnet magnetic lights and lights that can go anywhere, tiny lights. So I was out of a job working on cars with my dad. But now that <laughs> now maybe you know my son, soon to be son, will be holding my iPad for me while I'm um, working on the car. When you work on your car, Tom, and you basically have to refer to a video or something do you have any tricks or is it a matter of, you know just back and forth yeah i do a lot of printing i print out pieces of paper and, and i take notes um but I, I know my kids would be this is an opportunity to use my old laptop or my old uh, phone or whatever for the greasy stuff and i need a new phone or new gizmo for the day-to-day -day stuff so Good point. offering up their phones is the old one yeah. and you buy them a new one <laughs> I actually, I, I I do have a hand-me-down phone where they have the new phone. So. <laughs> oh, you're a good father. You're a good dad. Well, like you said, the good news is not only are they not going away, but maybe we're going to actually have a, more sources uh, uh, of them, of which obviously you can go online and, and, and purchase. You know, it is, we are doing this uh, show sort of uh, at the end of uh, spring, and uh, a lot of people have been asking us, is there anything new or something that we should do in spring cleaning that maybe we haven't thought of before? And uh, Tom, when we were planning uh, this uh, podcast, you mentioned um, a lot of aluminum parts. We've got more and more aluminum parts on cars and maybe they need some special attention in the spring. You want to elaborate on that? Yeah, that as cars last longer, there's more aluminum parts and as they last longer, aluminum has time to corrode and wear down. I opened the hood of my 92 Dodge van and it's sort of like a, a, a sand castle and the tie starting to come yeah. in. Uh, all the edges are just kind of worn off a bit. And uh, the aluminum um, corrodes immediately if it's exposed to air. And usually that layer of corrosion, the aluminum oxide, it protects it. But if you, if you constantly wear it away, like, like the under hood conditions, salty water coming up and abrading it away, then you get that, it, it actually erodes away. So springtime, the most apparent thing on a lot of cars are the aluminum wheels. And you might be tempted to, hey, I can make this a little bit shinier, putting a buffing wheel on it or something. You, you got to keep in mind that there's probably a coating on there. Uh, I mean, there, there certainly was some sort of coating on there originally, which could be like a clear coat, or, or it could be the, the uh, part was dipped in, in that, some sort of acid bath or something to create the right uh, consistency of aluminum oxide across the surface and the right appearance. So you got to be careful you're not buffing off or, or scraping off the, the, the coating and, and you'll actually hurt the, uh, the appearance of the, the part. If you have some sort of polishing compound, make sure it's made for aluminum that it's supposed to replace what it takes off with some sort of, some sort of coating. What, what about you know things that you don't necessarily see and, and you're not that much concerned about bringing them back to a, a polished condition. I'm thinking about aluminum suspension parts. In my case, I was just rolling up the uh, uh, tonneau cover on my pickup truck and I noticed all the aluminum ribs were covered in uh, uh, corrosion. What do you, and I looked online and I found as many uh, you know things on there about how to basically get the, uh, the oxide off as you could possibly imagine. 
what would you do if you wanted to, you know, just protect those parts a little bit, get some of the corrosion off, do a little spring cleaning? Yeah, protection was the main main thing. I, I would paint them. I would clean off the paint them. the uh, oxide that's crumbling away. And, and, and if you want to keep the appearance looking the same, you could use clear coat. But if you don't care about or, or you want to have another fun color, then just paint them with your favorite color of, of paint. Interesting. And, and some of the paint manufacturers, Rust William or somebody, might have paint that they say is, is better for exposed aluminum than others. I'm not sure. Hmm. That's a good. That's a good point. I I work with that's the peel off paint would work. I've seen them use that for wheels as well. The plastic mm. spray on peel off stuff, which gives a look and also is removable or replaceable down the road. That's another good point. Um, the last thing uh, that that before we move on to our our look at the Honda Civic, uh, there's a lot of stuff in the news post pandemic about the lack of rental cars in uh, at airports as people are starting to travel a little bit more. I read one thing where he said somebody had had rented an economy car and they gave him the keys to a full-size uh, pickup truck. And uh, people are getting in these vehicles. They have no clue what they're driving. Uh, I think, Tom, you've probably done as more traveling than even us over the years. What do you recommend to people that come to you and say, look, I'm getting ready to, to rent a small car. What should I know before I hop in or drive away anyway? It's funny you mentioned the, the pickup truck. That's been real common um, even before the pandemic. I wouldn't mess with the economy car, compact, mid-size, full-size stuff. That, that doesn't seem to mean anything anymore. Uh, part, part of it is there's not those standard small, medium, large cars. Mm -hmm. There's all these crossovers and stuff. But I, I just always re reserve the economy. And I think the smallest thing I've had in the last year is a Mazda 3. And mm -hmm. that was kind of my choice. There's often pickup trucks in the economy section. I'm not sure why, if it's the, the uh, truck manufacturers are giving them deals or there's, they're not as popular for people who want a smaller car for the city. But I'd say the majority of my economy cars over the past year have been full-size Ram and, and Ford. Really? Wow. So you really are the, yep. the, the rule that I was talking about. So that's cool. I just read where they're, they're renting U-Haul vehicles in Hawaii because they're cheaper. <laughs> Tourists are renting U-Haul trucks and driving around because they can save money. <laughs> yeah, but if you don't put that many miles on it, that's the way U-Haul usually gets their money is by miles. So. And the economy section is, is often, there's these cars that are in limbo. They often, they have out-of-state plates and, and somehow that doesn't quite fit in their system. So you go to the economy section and I've had um, full size or uh, minivans, Nissan, I, there was a Nissan Pathfinder that, that had a, a sign on the window that said it had Ontario plates and it says, please take on one way north. <laughs> so the real car company is trying to get it back to Canada somehow. So I, I've had super good luck with the economy. Um, it, I enjoy different vehicles. So, hey, I Mazda 3 this week, Ram 1500 next week. And, and I've never been cramped. The, the hardest vehicles to find might actually be if, if on the reservation sites, it always says Chevy Spark or similar. If, yeah. if you actually want a Chevy Spark or small car, they may not have them. That, that, that may be, if you really want a small, you prefer small vehicles or you, you're going to be in a big city or something, those may be harder to find. Mm. When you, uh, when you get to, is, is, yeah. sure. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, when you get to the lot though, do you just hop in and drive off or do you actually do a little reconnoiter around the vehicle inside and out before you uh, take to the road? I must admit, I usually don't, so. Yeah, and, and they're with some of the COVID, um, first let me say that the staff at, at all the rental car places during the pandemic have been amazing. I, they, I, I rented, uh, I went to the counter, the lady behind the counter said, wait a minute, she disappears. I see a Ford F-150 pull up in the circular drive in front of the airport and it's her and she's washing my rent-a-car and, and it, you know, cleaning it inside and she comes back to the desk and gives me the keys. It's like they're, they're working their butts off. But part of the, I've seen that they're, they're trying to reduce the paperwork and, and sometimes you don't, go to, you don't go to the desk anymore. You just go right up to the lot. And I, uh, I asked for the paperwork. It, it, it's, 
they may have a plan that, okay, we're not doing paperwork for COVID or to ease things, but I don't know if it's a one-way rental. I don't know if the next uh, people are going to say, okay, you don't have the damage form showing all the dings and scratches and mm. bonks on this vehicle. Mm. Or, or you get pulled over by the state police in a neighboring state, and, and he doesn't know that rental car companies aren't giving out paperwork anymore. So he's like, well, I don't know if you own this vehicle or stole it or what. Mm -hmm. So if, if you ask for paperwork, I've always been able to get it. Like even when you exit some airports, they'll have a, a, a gate and a gate attendant. That person has been able to print it out for me. So yeah, I would take the time to ask for the paperwork. And when I return cars, I, I sometimes I can't, but like we'll, we'll email this, but I try desperately to get paperwork to show that, yeah, I brought back this $40,000 car and, and turned it in. And, and I've actually gone to the desk inside the airport sometimes to ask for that. It's like, okay, the person that I turned the car into couldn't, can you print me out a receipt? Yeah. And, and if, if it's a business trip, I need, you know, I'll need a receipt for, you know, submitting for sure. first mix. So yeah, that's some good that tips before. there. Great. Yeah. I, I know the one thing I do do is I take, take my cell phone and just walk around the car and take pictures of everything, even if it's an unblemished uh, body panel. Uh, to make sure I've got some record uh, that this is the way I condition I got the car. Yep. Yeah, man, last week I rented a, a, a Jeep Compass Trailhawk economy car that, that was like a new level, like a PhD level of weirdness for, for renting cars. It, it, uh, it had 77,000 miles on it, which is like double what I've ever seen on a rental car before. It, it, it was covered with dings and and chips in the windshield and stuff. And, and it, it was a vehicle where it's like, not only walk around, but this car has so many miles on it. I, I look at rental car miles as like, you know, it's like dog years versus human years. <laughs> 77,000 miles is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so so, so that, that vehicle, I, I drew, I, I made, I took time to go through the screens and, and you know, look at all the, the um, you know, oil pressure and everything that it, it would reveal. And, I saw the uh, three of the tires were 10 pounds overinflated and one was about eight pounds underinflated. And so I took it to a, I stopped at a tire store and, and they adjusted the air pressures and then it, it, it stopped. I, I thought the uh, struts needed to be replaced or something. It was just very bouncy and there was clicking from the, I guess, ABS parts in the rear end and, and the rear uh, wheel hubs. It's once like I got the air. Yeah. Once the air was pumped up, it, it, it you know, it was fine. So. Well, I mean, it's a trail hawk, so maybe somebody <laughs> was taking it on the trail. Ah, who knows? <laughs> I don't know, well, man. The best you ride. Not the car well, the ride. Ride. I wonder if you're going to get back with it. <laughs> I made it back. But the best surprise, I got to the hotel, and I, I pull my suitcase, and I see there's a compartment under the cargo floor. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I wonder what I can put in there. And I open it up, and there's a, a couple, um, a grocery bag tied shut sitting there, just sitting. <laughs> And it was like kind of a horror movie thing. Do I do I open that? Do I <laughs> pretend I didn't see that? So I, is it full of hundred dollar bills, or uh, is there a human head in there? So, Use diaper, probably. <laughs> so I carefully pried it open because of curiosity. I'm, I'm a cat, I guess, and it, it was full of underwear. And it, it was it was funny. My next thought was like, well, I wonder if this is my size. <laughs> <laughs> at, at that point, it's funny I, I <laughs> most of your head, but at that point I said let's, let's wrap this up and I carefully collect it out and put it in the nearby trash can and, <laughs> but, so yeah yeah the car was super clean for for COVID but yeah besides forget the bag of underwear in the back I guess that, that my dirty laundry they stashed back yeah, there I forgot about I, Ain't that an unfortunate fact of life? The underwear is never the right size. <laughs> yeah, 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 it might have been not the right gender either. I just saw the brand name on the waistband. And, but. Well, I think I think I this is the this has been a first time conversation on a motor <laughs> podcast. First time we've ever mentioned underwear. <laughs> I don't think we've done this before. Two hundred fifty five podcasts. <laughs> well, I have absolutely no transition. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> We're, well, we should probably move along if we don't want this podcast to last two hours. The one car we were going to talk about this week was the unveiling of the new generation of the uh, Honda Civic. And over the life of the Civic, they've seemed to have this policy that they'll do a, a generation where they've done major revamping. 
then the next generation is kind of evolutionary. And this one seems a little bit evolutionary. But Greg, why don't you what kind of walk us through what uh, the 2022 Civic, at least the sedan that we've seen, uh, has to offer and what it looks like and where it fits. That's a pretty good point, John, because that last generation, uh, so this is the 11th, the 10th generation was quite a radical change. I mean, it, and I think it uh, got a lot of good press for its, its looks. Um, so this 11th generation, it's, it almost like, to me, it kind of looks a little retro. So they call the design like a thin and light design. And that's actually, of all the design terms I've ever heard for cars, like this one might be the most descriptive because it is, it's like, the, the front end gets like very narrow. Uh, the the uh, the headlights are thin and wide, and the grill, you know, contrary to a, a growing trend, is actually quite small. The lower yeah. grill gets a little bit bigger, um, but it's it's uh, very horizontal both inside and out. Uh, but like I said, it, it's kind of hard to describe. But when you hear that it's a thin and light, and that's that's their term. Um, y- y- that's exactly what it looks like. It's, it's kind of hard to explain. Um, but so uh, inside there, they've um, made it, brought it up to, uh, you know, modern technology. It starts with a standard seven inch touch screen. You can go up to a nine inch. There's digital uh, screens within the instrument cluster. Um, and then um, so to the performance, they have uh, carryover engines. They're starting with the two liter naturally aspirated 158 horsepower 138 pound feet of torque that's like your your intro basic engine uh you can go a little bit small you jump up by going smaller to the 1.5 liter turbo four uh, and that gives you uh, 180 horsepower 177 pound feet of torque both around 35 36 miles per gallon at best uh, which is pretty pretty decent uh, the only the downside of the powertrain, depending on who you are, is that it's uh, CVT only right now in the sedan. Um, when that when a C, when an SI comes out and probably the Type R will see the manual, they're not saying that the manual is gone. But if you want a Civic sedan right now, it's going to be a CVT. Yeah, you know, I really it's interesting you mentioned retro the interior and the exterior. I really thought the interior was kind of retro in one aspect. The dash is very linear. You know, it's, you've got all, you've got these three controls right in the middle, but you know, if it wasn't for the touchscreen mounted on top, uh, that bottom part of that instrument panel could have come out of something from the 1960s. So it's kind of a, an interesting and a little bit odd for them combination of very modern and a bit retro. I like the look of it myself. I, I thought it was pretty cool. And they, they're, they're back to knobs. So you have a volume yep. knob, you have uh, knobs for the climate control, which I, if you've listened to our podcast a lot, you probably think we're just complaining about the smallest thing. But I mean, it's, it's so frustrating when you can't just turn up or turn down the stereo with a quick roll of the knob. I do want to note that uh, they actually made a pretty big deal, um, not necessarily about the Honda sensing, but a safety feature, which is like, they're, they're calling it a revolutionary front airbag system because uh, what the driver gets is like a donut shaped airbag, which is supposed to like control in the event of an accident, control the head of the driver so they can better keep it in one area to prevent um, the situation where you would get a brain injury. So they actually made a big deal about that, which I feel like it's been kind of quiet in the airbag industry lately. Yeah. No, I hadn't heard, I didn't recognize it. That's, that's actually, that's probably one of the first advances in a driver's side front airbag in a long time. That's interesting. Dave, any comment? You've seen the pictures like the rest of us. Really? Right. Um, I just seem like it wasn't a, an evolutionary design. It's the right Civic for right now. There's still room to grow it in the future and meet, meet future demands. But right now it's all about the new technologies things like that. People want that right now. So they met that need and it's a fine car. Tom, in your business, are you seeing any downside to these uh, touch screens being mounted on the top of the dash versus down in the dash? Is it same kind of repairs? Are they more susceptible to sun damage or anything like that? I think it's still too early. We, we haven't seen any, any, they're just not failing, either one failing at fast enough rate to know yet if, if one's better than the other. So, well, that's a good thing. 
Okay, well, let's move on to our um, lightning round. Uh, basically, we've got a, a topic that our producer Greg here has picked out of the press, and uh, let's uh, get at it. There's been a recent flurry of new vehicle press releases revealing new off-road minded trim packages. For instance, we've seen uh, most recently the Subaru Outback Wilderness. There's a Toyota Sienna Woodland Special Edition, Ford Explorer Timberline. I think there was a, uh, a Pathfinder model this couple of years ago, they kicked that off. Is this a coincidence or are manufacturers seeing some sort of trend with customers? What do you think? I think it's a trend based on COVID. People are finally trying to get out and travel alone into the, in the out, outback areas, excuse the term. Um, Toyota, Toyota said as much in their press release that towing rates are up. Um, people are camping more, buying more RV trailers and trying to get out and do more away from people, but still get out and do things and enhance some activity. Mm. So I think it's a trend that they're jumping on top of. Also, I would say I put the Santa Cruz in that category that sport activity yeah. vehicle, little pickup truck they came out with. Um, Toyota with the Sienna, they're donating money to the National Environmental Education Foundation for every of the, of the Woodland Series purchase up to a quarter million dollars or something. So they're putting a charity aspect into it as well. It could be good marketing, could be corporate citizenship, who knows, but it's a trend. Greg, anything to add? Yeah, I, I don't. <sighs> I don't really have any numbers to back it up. I think it, we hear all these stories of people wanting to go out and do the things that Dave said. And maybe that that's true because, I mean, we're hearing about it, but I maybe I'm a little cynical. I kind of feel like a lot of people like just the look of it more so than the functionality of it. And I can't blame them. I mean, it looks good. The off-road packages tend to be some of the cooler looking vehicles i mean you see them with jeeps all the time rubicons and how many you know perfectly clean jeep rubicons do you <laughs> see you know what i mean like I, I and they look good and people are willing to pay the extra for them and not necessarily use them as they're intended yeah i think it's just a matter of looking tough i mean we've they can't build enough and you know tough looking trucks and i think you know it started with the big mouth grills over at uh, ram and dodge and now it's worked its way into everything and People want that capability. Look, I, I'm, a, I'm not really sure that adding a half to an inch worth of ground clearance is going to give you that much more true rough and tumble, uh, you know, abilities. But you're right. They look they look pretty cool. Tom, any impression? You live in the, the great Northwest where people get out an awful lot more than they probably do around uh, here in the mid-Atlantic. I, I really think it's it's a good idea that the manufacturer – the manufacturers are smart. It's equipment that's already on a lot of vehicles. Mm. A lot of vehicles have all-wheel drive for rain and snow. So why not add switches that, that let you choose between rain and, and, and sand and snow and all these things that the car is already doing automatically? It's already through all the ABS sensors and the all-wheel drive system. It's all there. So yeah, gussy it up with switches yeah. and make it seem... Opportunity it, it's kind marketing. of emphasizing what you have. Yeah. Mm. What was that, Dave? Opportunity marketing. Mm, could be. Unfortunately, because of the chip shortage, they can't build anything. So <laughs> we've got all these interesting new models that we're going to have to wait. Which brings us to, uh, you know, sparking about a big thing about off-roading is uh, tires. And we actually have a viewer question about tires. And Tom, I'm going to put you on the spot because you're kind of our resident guru on all things uh, uh, have to do with parts and mechanics today. Uh, this is from Gary, who says he's just bought a set of Pirelli winter tires and would like to know how to handle directional tire rotation. Wants to know if it's any different than summer directional tires. And directional tires mean basically uh, they are meant to be mounted on one side of the vehicle. Tom, any advice? What would you do? Yeah, I would just move them from front to back every year, every winter just switch the two and it, it, it's simple. And then with the winter tires, I would be sure to take them off, but they, they wear faster if you get above 40 degrees and mm -hmm. you know, take them on the freeway or something. So yeah, don't think it's, well, let's work, leave these on year round. So the same uh, rotation pattern that would apply to any directional tire for summer or all weather applies to winter, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yep. All right, Gary, I hope that uh, helps. And that was actually a, a, a pretty quick answer on it. Usually these questions, uh, we have a lot more discussion, but I'm not sure what else you'd say. <laughs> the only other thing I just might add is that if you have, um, and Tom, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if you've got non-directional winter tires, you'd still use the X pattern going from front one side to rear on the other and, and vice versa. Yeah, I'm not even sure those exist. If, if they're official winter tires, my personal experience is they're always one side Direct. or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but, yeah. Because if, the asymmetrical exist, I would say thread. Right. Yeah. I guess, yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, I think that's a, a good way to wrap up uh, this week's podcast. Uh, I want to thank everybody that's uh, joined us today. Greg, Dave, and Tom, thank you very much for carving out the time in your day to, to join us. And I also want to thank all the folks behind the scenes, our audio engineer, Jim Bigwood, of course, Greg, for producing this podcast and our podcast creator, Bob Mixter. Everybody out there, thanks very much for listening and viewing this week's Motor Week podcast. Don't forget to watch Motor Week on your local public television stations. Go to our website, motorweek.org. About the show is a tab up on the right-hand side. Pull it down, put your zip code in there, and you can find out where the local uh, station is. And, um, excuse me, what time of day? Also, our friends over at the Motor Trend Cable Network. Well, most weeks we're on Tuesday nights at 7.30 for a new show premiere, and it runs various other times. Basically, if you've got a screen, you can watch us. Uh, go to youtube.com slash motorweek and you can see just about everything we've done for a long, long time in the rearview mirror, including our, um, our, our uh, marathons of all of our classics that uh, Ben Davis puts together every once in a while. Till next time, thanks everybody out there. Thanks for watching, thanks for listening, and thanks for being a part of Motor Week. You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine, Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com and RockAuto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.